everybody, and welcome back to the Dallas Darts Organization International Podcast. This is part of our Dowie Talks Expert Series. My guest today is Viet Le of Wu Tan, Seattle. He's a practitioner of several different styles, including Baji Chuen, Bagua Zhang, Yang, and Chen style Tai Chi, and Hungar Kung Fu, as well as traditional Vietnamese martial arts. In addition to his martial arts practice, Viet is a graduate of the Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine and completed a fellowship in behavioral and cognitive neurology at the University of Cincinnati in 2020. Viet, thanks for taking time out to talk to me today. I appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. So uh, you're, you're originally from California, is that right? Yeah, that's where I was born and raised. Um, but because of medical school, that took me to various parts of the country, but I'm originally from Southern California. And you started training pretty early on at like, I think age seven, is that right? Yeah. So I, um, um, my dad was in the South Vietnamese army, mm -hmm. um, before the end of the war. So he felt that he wanted his kids to have some kind of exposure to martial arts. Um, and so my first sojourn was when I was in elementary school, we had a Shaolin Kung Fu teacher actually come and teach at the school. Um, and he started me off with uh, letting me enroll in those classes. Um, but, you know, it's more like a childcare kind of thing, right? Okay. Kids running around and uh, the teacher trying to uh, keep our attention with stances and all. Um, my dad didn't quite understand uh, Kung Fu. And even in South Vietnam, uh, before 1975, Chinese Kung Fu was really guarded um, and it wasn't really widely taught uh, to the Vietnamese people. And so he didn't have, he didn't really know what it was and he had really a strong impression about it. Taekwondo had a stronger impression on him. Um, so he took me out of those classes and he put me in Taekwondo. I think I was around maybe nine, 10. And he told me that I should set a goal of getting a black belt. And then afterwards I could make up my mind and do whatever I want. So mm -hmm. I did um, WTF type, like athletic competitive Taekwondo. And I got, I went up to having a black belt second degree. And then I took a little bit of a break because school started to get harder. In high school, I went, uh, once I got my car, I went back to my Shaolin teacher. Um, and I continued to study with him until I got into college at UCLA. Uh, so that was like sort of the first chapter of my martial arts journey. So why did you decide to go back to your Kung Fu teacher? Did you enjoy that more? Was there something from that practice that you kind of connected with? I think, you know, doing Taekwondo for, first off, like I basically skipped every other belt. So uh, my parents wanted me to be able to put this on my high school resume yeah. that uh, I was a black belt in an Olympic sport yeah. and a martial art, right? So mm -hmm. my dad was so focused on that. And I was sort of burnt out from uh, going through the ring so quickly. Yeah. Um, and I didn't really feel, pardon those people who do Taekwondo, I didn't really feel there was a lot of substance to it, right? Like, you know, I could have stayed in a little bit longer, got more belts and everything. But um, in the process of rushing, I think I, I didn't respect it as much. Right. Um, and there was something, you know, at the time, like I started watching more Kung Fu movies and that, that really drew me into it. Um, I started reading just a little bit of philosophy, whatever I could understand. Um, and it made me want to explore that part again. Right. Yeah. My first uh, Shaolin teacher, he was actually Korean Chinese. Interesting background. He, uh, there's a lot of stories around him. So I don't know what's true or what's not. And over the years, I've talked to multiple people from the school. So I've been able to gather a general picture about him. Um, his name was Duke Chang, uh, Cheng Yunmin. Um, his family was originally from Shandong, uh, which is in Northeast China. And they migrated to Korea probably around World War II. Um, his family supposedly uh, worked in the palace of the Qing dynasty. And because they had their political leanings was actually to restore the Qing dynasty during that upheaval period with warlords and all, uh, they decided to 
leave China and move to Incheon in Korea. Um, and he continued to practice his family style of Northern Shaolin, um, as well as Plum Flower Mantis um, and Bagua. Eventually, he moved to Taiwan and through some kind of uh, familial link, I, I'm not sure whether his, his cousin or, or somebody was related to Wei Shaotang. Wei Shaotang was the, uh, the person who spread uh, Eight Step Mantis to Taiwan. Um, he was able to learn Babu Taiwan, Eight Step Mantis from Wei Shaotang directly. And I think when I look at some of the sets now, I think he had spent some time with another individual by the name of Fan Jie Xiao, who was a graduate of the Central Martial Arts Academy, Nanjing Guo Shu Guan, um, which was sort of an effort by the nationalist government to bring all those teachers under one roof. Um, and his teacher had been a graduate of that. He probably, Fan Jie Xiao, as far as I know, was of the same generation, uh, you know, Shi Xiongdi with uh, Han Qingtang, who uh, enjoys maybe a slightly more famous reputation because of students like, or grand students, great grand students, like uh, the famous Dr. Yang Jingming and everything. Mm -hmm. um, so what he taught at his school in Buena Park, California was sort of a mixture of his experiences, right? I know that we started off with some very basic sets, just going up and down the room. The school was very narrow um, and all our sets were basically straight lines for the most part. And, um, and then as we got into more advanced forms, I noticed that, you know, we would bring in some of the long fist material from Fan Jie Xiao that I know now, right after doing my own little research, there are some unique sets that, uh, I think Chinese teachers in Korea had created. Um, so uh, he had sets like uh, Hei Hu Chua, uh, Jin Gang Chua. Uh, these names seem very nondescript. Lots of styles have those sorts of uh, names of sets, but these sets were a combination of both Northern Shaolin and Praying Mantis together. Um, so it was a hybrid. And I think that these Korean Chinese sets were invented to teach the Koreans. They didn't want to teach the Koreans the quote unquote real stuff. It's not that it's not that it's bad material at all, yeah. uh, but maybe they were hiding something. And so the, the creation of these hybrid sets, um, you know, came about and he also taught those. Um, he taught his mantis. He taught a mixture of plum flower and eight stuff. And then the internal arts like Tai Ji, Ba Wa, Xin Yi, like I didn't really learn at that time when I was in high school. Um, so I mainly focused on the, the Northern Shaolin and the praying mantis material at the time. So is, he, is, your, is that teacher still alive? Is he still around, still teaching? He is, but the school has since closed. Huh. And so, you know, as goes on with a lot of Kung Fu schools, when as a school goes through many generations of students, people go away, people uh, start to accuse other people of watering things down. <clears throat> uh, and so the school survives in pieces in, in Orange County. So I can tell you that there's a branch school in Brea, there's a branch school in Tustin, uh, and these are very dedicated practitioners. Right. Um, but the original school and his students, he, he grew old. He got into his 80s. You know, it was something that you know, I think most people don't understand that most teachers, when they came to America, they had really no intention of teaching Kung Fu. Yeah. Right. So he was actually a, a car mechanic originally. Yeah. And I think someone in the shop, from what I could tell in the 60s or 70s, said, hey, this guy knows something. And initially he taught Taekwondo. Right. So in the Chinese community in in San Gabriel Valley, you know, I, I eventually met my chef with Jason. So and he knows of my first teacher. He's like, your teacher was known for teaching Taekwondo. Right. Um, and, you know, then he taught sort of a mixture of both. And then finally, he just committed himself to teaching Kung Fu. Um, so, you know, he he never really intended to teach. It was sort of a way for him to make money. 
Um, and, you know, it got his kid to Harvard. His kid is an anesthesiologist and, you know, he's got grandkids now he's in his eighties. And, you know, once it came time that, and it became clear that no one really wanted to take over the school, which was sad. Um, he said, look, I, I think I'm going to retire. So that was it. Yeah. I revisited him just occasionally whenever I came home uh, to visit my my parents. And I remember one time, like, I think he probably forgot who I was because I no longer wore glasses. I was a little fatter. And he said, well, oh, if you're that kid, you're you're chubby now. You need to practice again and lose weight. Um, but I didn't really, it, it just didn't, there wasn't that affinity. I, I didn't choose to continue. I've learned the material over the years from his students. But the time that I spent directly with him, I think pretty much after high school, I, I just stopped my involvement, right? Yeah. And it wasn't out of any bitterness or anything. It was just the distance and timing and all of that. But I still hold his material in high regard. And I remember during the pandemic, uh, you know, I've been just trying to record all the forms that I can remember. And I was able to pick up some of those sets and I just put them on video for my record. And for anybody interested, I just put it up there. And that's got me a lot of uh, new contacts. Um, people who studied with him from the 60s and 70s and were able to corroborate what he taught and um, how his curriculum evolved over time. So that was nice. Yeah. So when you went to UCLA, UCLA is that where you met Jason Cho? So yeah, so um, I, uh, I was a so UCLA is split into two parts, North and South Campus. And um, I'll be honest, I was pressured to major in something that would get me into medical school by my parents. Um, I, I often tell this as a joke. Um, I don't know if you know anything about Asian parenting, but there's not really a lot of choice, right? And so my mom is an anesthesiologist. And I remember coming back from school, like elementary school, and say, hey, you know, one of my friends wants to be a fireman, another one's one of them wants to be a policeman. What can I be when I grow up? I said, oh, you have choice. You can be any kind of doctor you want to be. You can be a heart doctor, stomach doctor, lung doctor, so long as it's a doctor, right? And so, uh, you know, that along with just pressure from friends and stuff like that, you don't really know what you want to do when you go to college for some kids. So I was a psychobiology major, and um, which meant that the first two years I, I spent completing my pre-med um, classes in the last two years I did psych which was a little bit more of my interest at the time um, and you know luckily there were some elect there's time to take some electives and um, my teacher I actually had met my teacher before he had taught at UCLA um, and I was a very kind of greedy person about kung fu I thought I could pay for things um, so he had been teaching in Southern California for quite a bit of time. He had originally come from Taiwan to the east part of the United States. Uh, he went to Dartmouth uh, for his degree in chemistry and he taught in that area. Um, and then he moved to Southern California in the seventies and he used to have a school um, that closed down probably in earlier mid nineties. Um, so he was teaching at an elementary school in Monterey Park and I wrote, had written him an email. I was like, oh, I've heard, of, I've, I've read about Wutan, I've heard about Wutan, and here's what I want to learn. I want to learn uh, Shao Kaiman, which is our first basic Bagua form. I want to learn Miao Dao, which is our long saber. And I want to learn uh, Da Baji, because that's the most representative form of the Baji system. How much is this going to cost and how much is it going to take? How, how long is it going to take me to do this? And he, he said, well, let, let's meet up first. Right. And I'm like 18, 19 years old. You know, I've watched a couple of movies. I've read some back then it was the forums. Right. So I read a lot of posts on forums and like I knew exactly what I wanted. And I thought, you know, I, I, I'm, I already have this background, Northern Shaolin. It's just another form. Right. This is not going to be difficult for me. I can probably get this done in a couple of private lessons. Right. So I came out to the park and um He's like, okay, uh, how about I teach you the basics of Bagua? And in our Bagua system, we have this drill called Zhuan Shen Ge, uh, Chen, sorry, Zhuan Shen Zhen Guo. So it's this kind of threading wrapping drill, right? And he had me do it against a tetherball pole, right? Mm -hmm. 
and there's no shade or anything and it's it's hot and sunny and i'm doing this and i'm thinking like you know minutes pass by a half an hour passes by and I, you know I, I look at my cell phone I, i'm like how long is it going to make me do this when are we going to get to the form and the whole three hour session passed by and he came and gave me some pointers maybe once or twice and that was it and i was like wait a bit maybe is this the right guy did i did i email the right person like I didn't even think about like he was just hazing me, but I didn't even think about it. I was just like, maybe he doesn't know what I'm saying. You know, he's kind of old and I don't know. I, I don't think I'm going to come back. So I don't come back. And then just it was kind of weird to see him again at UCLA. You now he's teaching a class at the World Arts and Culture Department and he's teaching uh, the Yang style Taiji long form. And I walk in there and I, I'm like, I don't know, like I might as well try this class, right? It's free now, right? And it's on campus. I can make time for this. And we go through the form and then eventually, because, you know, most of those kids were all dance majors. None of them had Kung Fu backgrounds. So I was able to pr progress pretty rapidly. I was able to remember choreography, go to stances, whatever. Um, and I was willing, you know, he even invited me to do some applications on me. Um, which is on a college campus, especially in California, that's not common because kids then and kids today, uh, if you get the slightest bit hurt and you report your teacher, it's a big deal. But he's like, ah, I think Vic can take it. So uh, we eventually got to a point where, you know, he asked me, weren't you that kid who came, you know, uh, maybe a couple months ago in my class and never came back. And I was like, yeah, um, yeah, that's me. And I, I sort of realized like he knew what he was doing. I just was none the wiser. So he invited me out again. And he's like, okay, this time, you know, it's going to take you time to learn this stuff. Don't ever think that you're going to learn this right, up, right off the bat with me. Right. Um, and I'm going to teach you the real way. Okay, so you can pick between the Baji class and the Bagua class, right? But once you pick, you're going to commit to it, right? So, oh, oh, okay, okay. This is the real Kung Fu opportunity now, right? Um, and, you know, I wanted to learn everything, um, but I thought, you know, maybe it's time to learn slower. Um, the Bagua class at that time had the curriculum for our Bagua is pretty extensive. And I knew that I needed to learn slower. That would probably make me better. So mm -hmm. I uh, decided to join the Baji class. And I continued to do Baji until I graduated from, from UCLA. So I did those classes on the side. I tried to make as much time as I could through getting rides from friends or finding other ways to get to class. But um, I got to basically the Ba Baji level before I left college. I mean, right at the time I left college, right? So that so our body system has uh, basically four levels, um, Xiao Baji, Da Baji, Liu Da Kai, and Baji Liu Hai. The small form, the big form, um, the sixth grade openings and the linking form. So I had, I was able to run through basics. He would teach a line of the form each session. So. Um, we split Shabaji into eight lines, Dabaji into eight lines. And so we would do one line per session, right? And slowly but surely, I was able to get to that point before I left for Philadelphia for my master's degree. So that's kind of my college side. We'll still we still talk about that time because during those years I was in college, I'll admit the first alcoholic beverage I had was with my teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, we had just finished up a performance and we went out to uh, a restaurant and I think he was proud of me for what I did. So he's like, Hey, have you had this before? And I was like, no, I haven't. I truly had not drunk before I had met my teacher. I was like, have a sip of this. And uh, it was a, it was a glass of wine and we didn't talk about it afterwards, but in my book, that was the first step towards being an adult. Check. Yeah. Momentous occasion. <laughs> so for, you're the first person I think that we've talked to that's uh, associated with the Wu Tang uh, organization. Could you maybe explain to our um, audience uh, 
a little bit about the history of that organization and, and um, you know, its curriculum? Sure. Um, so the Wu-Tang organization um, basically is uh, in, it's centered in Taiwan. Um, and it was founded by an individual by the name of uh, Grandmaster Liu Yunqiao. Um, I have some dates available for people who are checking. Uh, this is just me pulling from some resources. So uh, he was born in 1909 and passed in 1992. Um, he was originally from uh, a region of northern China called Changzhou uh, in Hebei province. Um, and his family was pretty well off. Uh, but he was, uh, as typical of these sort of origin stories, he was kind of sickly. And his teacher, uh, his family, sorry, hired uh, a bodyguard for him to teach him Kung Fu and strengthen him, as well as protect the family. Um, Changzhou is famous uh, even now as being like a, a center of martial arts. Lots of different styles are practiced there. Uh, there's a story that whenever there were officials or the emperor that would cross by that area, they would get off their horse, Shama, right? Because if you appeared lordly or you appeared higher than anybody else, someone would try to uh, kind of even it up a little bit. So mm -hmm. everybody stayed humble. Um, Tanjo is also unique because it's home to um, a uh, Muslim um, minority and they have preserved certain aspects of Chinese martial arts to this day, right? Um, I think Chinese culture is one of those unique things and Chinese martial arts is one of those unique things that we sort of divide martial arts according to religion. Um, and I'm careful to say that what we classify now as Chinese Muslim martial arts is still Chinese martial arts. It's just a subsection of it. It's just because the Muslim community in, in Northern China, they were close knit and they preserved those traditions right they didn't they didn't change it easily because there was a lot there was an influx of in and out within that community right, right. but if you look at other uh, styles practiced by muslim communities in other countries like salat right. um you're going to notice inevitably certain similarities but mostly differences right so um, I'm careful to say that Chinese Muslim martial arts are still Chinese martial arts. Anyways, I'm going on a little tangent. So uh, Grandmaster Liu learned initially uh, Mi Zhong Chua, uh, lost track boxing with his bodyguard. And uh, he learned two forms from him. The forms are very basic. I won't profess to say that it's a complete system. Um, I don't know whether he learned more of... Uh, that system, but he did teach his his descendants those two basic forms, right? Um, then on, his family hired uh, Li Shu Wen, who was uh, purportedly very good at spear fighting, Ba Ji Chua and Pi Wa Zhang, um, to the household, um, and he subsequently focused on those arts. Right, Baji, Piwa, and Spear. Um, Li Shuwen went through many periods of his life. His art evolved over time. And mm -hmm. now that I've been able to interact with other practitioners and, and obviously see footage and read resources, it can be quite different, right? Uh, Li Shuwen, in his early period, um, taught. Um, his first disciple who became the bodyguard for the, for the last emperor of China. So uh, Huo Dingge and the Huo family Baji that's practiced in Northeast China in Manchuria and Dongbei, right? Um, their power generation looks pretty different from ours, right? And I would say that, uh, you know, in his middle period, the Wei family, um, and there is currently a, descendant teaching in Toronto, Canada, of all places that I came and visited, um, they have certain characteristics. And then our Baji, which is, represents Li Shuwen's last period, um, retirement period, old man period, right. has certain characteristics, right? And that's to be expected. I'm not going to say who's right, who's wrong. People, people change. Um, 
And we shouldn't go about saying that, you know, oh, because Li Shu Wen was able to, uh, all his experiences were to coalesce at the end. He, he was able to be enlightened and, and came up with this brilliant strategy of, of taking out certain things and just holding on to the essence that his, his last period is probably the best period. No, it's just a period, right? right. Having now talked to other people and trained with other people, it's all good stuff, right? There's yeah. only good there's only good when you interact with other people um some of the changes he may have made just and this is based on my observations is that for example there are 12 versions of the of the small form we only practice one one version of it right and so maybe he thought no oh, i don't really have I, i'm teaching this kid and i don't really want to teach the basics again i've done that all my life right so i'm just going to teach him one i'm going to teach him one xiao jia or xiao ba ji right um, so he spent time with him for a good long while. Um, and then he decided to bring his, his disciple to other parts of China and do some challenges. Right. And so they headed towards Shandong, uh, to the East and along the way, he got into some matches and he got this reputation of, uh, being pretty good. And he got this moniker of being Xiaobawan, the little tyrant. Uh, but with that also came probably uh, some personality changes of arrogance. And these are the stories that are, I think, particularly interesting is when he got his butt kicked, right? Yeah. And so he met, for example, he met with this man named Ding Zicheng, who was uh, a practitioner of Six Harmony Praying Mantis. And this was an old man and uh, he got his butt kicked. And apparently he was able to learn some of the style after he got his butt kicked. Yeah. And then he went to, uh, when he went to further into Shandong, he met a Bagua teacher by the name of Gong Bao Tian. Uh, Gong Bao Tian, I think nowadays is famous because in the movie, The Grand Masters by Wang Kar Wai, um, he was featured in it and uh, Zhang Ziyi uh, played his daughter. So yeah. these are real individuals fictionalized for a movie, uh, but he was able to learn uh, Ba Wa Zhang uh, from Gong Ma Tian. Wow. Right? And then his Li Shu Wen, I think, got was kind of tired of traveling and decided to go back to, to Hebei. And unfortunately, on the way, he was either poisoned or he had a stroke or something, but he, he passed away on the way. Um, eventually, you know, Grandmaster Lu somewhere along the road and i'm not i'm saying this story out of order so for those interested i would definitely recommend looking up at the internet because that's probably the easiest way to find information about him he was recruited by the nationalist government and he became a secret agent and this really didn't come to light until uh after he had been in taiwan there were some movies made about him he had this moniker uh so you know 007 um james bond he was 001 right and uh, his, his responsibility was going out and killing warlords um, and opponents of the regime. Uh, eventually the nationalists lose, he goes to Taiwan. Um, and in an effort, he didn't really, he wasn't really interested in teaching martial arts at that time, uh, but somebody in the presidential palace knew that he was a, you know, knew that he had a lot of expertise, invited him to come out and teach again. To the bodyguards. Um, Grandmaster Lu, along with some of his students, decide to start a magazine uh, called, and they call it Wu Tan, uh, which Wu means martial, Tan means like a, a gathering place, right? And the intention was to bring people together, right? The magazine didn't last that long, but people would write letters asking, well, I want to learn this, I want to learn this, I want to learn this. And uh, that's where Grandmaster Lu would help out and people knew of him as students started to gather, right? For example, Adam Shu and, and Dr. Uh, Lun Kei Chi, uh, Master Su Yu Zhang, uh, Dai Shi Zhe. Um, this is where the school started to form, right? Probably around the 70s, right? And I got to say, when looking at the background of some of his students, uh, who we know to this day in the West, um, they actually were high level practitioners from other styles. 
So he had this habit of, or of attracting people, top <laughs> students from other systems. Yeah. Right. Um, so Adam Shu was, a was, you know, a top disciple of Han Xingtang and decided to come with Grandmaster Lu and Grandmaster Lu made him start all over again, right? Uh, Master, Grandmaster Su, who my teacher uh, was a student of and I'm descended from, had learned five different kinds of praying mantis before joining with Grandmaster Lu. Um, and so this nucleus that we have within our organization uh, which includes the arts that Grandmaster Lu had personally learned and taught, right? And I would say Baji, Pigua, and Bagua are probably our core arts, right? Uh, because of his students, they enrich the curriculum with their background. So from Adam Shu, we get his long fist um, and that he got from Han Xing Tang. Uh, Grandmaster Lu did say Adam Shu did learn uh, Chen Stao Tai Chi from, from Du Yu Zi. Uh, which was one of the four individuals that brought Chen Style to Taiwan. Um, so we bring those aspects from Adam Shu with Grandmaster Su. We get all that praying mantis in. Um, from Grandmaster Dai, because Grandmaster Lu had forgotten some of the six harmony mantis sets. And so most of the most of the six harmony mantis that we have now within the system was likely brought in by another student, Dai Shijua. Right. And so our curriculum is really rich, but the intention was never to, for people never to learn every single aspect. You are not forced to learn every single aspect. Um, you know, you, I think the, the certain core arts people should, people should have covered to a certain degree, should have some working knowledge of it. Um, I personally endeavored to learn everything. And that took me about 13 years, um, still practicing, still letting it sort of gel with me. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's, it's just a, it's just a treasure that we're able to have all that material. We get a lot of uh, criticisms that we tend to baji eyes everything. So our Chen style Taiji, if you do it in a competition, people are going to like, that's not, that's not Chen village Chen style, right? Or when we do Xing Yi Chua that we got from San Nan Qi, uh, which was another uh, friend of Grandmaster Lu's. Interestingly, he was a, uh, a pilot in the, the Nationalist Army and was actually a, a Xingyi practitioner from uh, Li Cunyi. Um, when we do, they're like, oh, that doesn't, like, when you do your bong chuan, it looks like bazi. And we get that criticism a lot. And I get it, right? And I'm not, I'm not denying that. Um, but for us, that's okay. Because we feel that Northern martial arts all share the same DNA, right? And rather than try to be like my personal trait, rather than me striving to be a Li Shuwen, right? The God of the spear or a Gong Ba Tian, I'm just trying to be the best me that I can be. Right. So you can feel free to take certain inspiration from different arts and make it your own, right? Um, that's the goal, I think, of having so many arts practice under one roof. Yeah. It's a really fascinating curriculum. And I, I, I did notice that, you know, the Pigua in there, um, is that is it often taught just by itself or is it taught sort of to augment the power generation in the baji because i know that sometimes students will like practice the piwa at, like at a certain stage like in their development to help their baji would you say that that's uh was that fair to say that it's more uh taught to uh um, augment the baji or is it sort of by itself i can answer this question in two ways so uh okay. one is how i learned it from my teacher Right. So he has his his way of doing it. And then when I've gone out to train with others, because I spend a lot of time with my Kung Fu uncle, uh, Tony Young in Ohio. Um, and I recently uh, in the month of uh, September or October of last year, I went into Taiwan yeah. and I was able to see it for myself. So um, in general, right, I, I Piwa is usually taught alongside Baji. And mm -hmm. we go through this process of switching between Baji, Piwa, Baji, Piwa. Right. So um, the thought is, is let's say you take you're forging a sword. Right. Wow. And you put it, you heat it up and then you, you cool it down, you heat up, you cool down. The, the, the purpose of that is to forge. Wow. Right. Yourself into something different. Right. So combining the, you know, 
ways of using the spine and long range power, um, no muscle, right? Using reaction force, right? From Pigua along with the explosive compact power generation of Baji. That's why we go back and forth. Baji is very rarely practiced by itself. Usually it's mixed with something, right? So for example, the Wu family, uh, Baji descendants uh, through Wuzhong, uh, in Mengchun uh, village in Hebei, the, the first uh, progenitor of Baji, they, they, they practice a single form from Piwa, right? Um, the Ma family in the Northeast, uh, they combine their Baji with uh, Tongbei and Piwa and Fandichuan. So very rarely amongst the different families is Baji practiced by itself, right? And usually in the process, what we do is we switch out Baji Piwa, Baji Piwa. So, you know, we'll typically go through the eight lines of Shao Baji, then learn the form, and then we switch to uh, Piwa. We'll do basics and lines, right? A lot of our system is line work, okay? Um, and line work, I mean, you go from one end of the room to another end of the room, repeating a single technique, usually a single technique, not really a combination. Um, and then we'll go back to Baji. And during those periods, we don't touch the other stuff. Right. So the po point is you just focus on that. So uh, if you like, I think Adam Shu wrote a really nice uh, vignette years ago where he described how he had wanted to learn Baji. Right. And Grandmaster Lu, after seeing his badge, like, oh, you don't, this is not working for you. I think you should do Pigua. Try to do just this for 100 days and see how you do. Right. Um, and I was inspired by that story because too often when you go from Baji to Pigua, you're still. Uh, let's just say it constipated, right? You don't know how to spread out and, and loosen up. Uh, so he spent a hundred days doing it, uh, people. And I, I also tried a similar, similar regimen and it worked, right? When you, if you really want something, uh, you need to give it time. That's mm -hmm. the biggest thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, you, and you, that, that other material will always be there because you put the time into it. Mm -hmm. But if you want to learn something new, you got to give it time. And, uh, you know, I think that's why we have that little rule, right? Our Pigua is not, I, I, from my observations, it's not a system. It, it really is just two forms and some lines, right? Um, and I think that Master Li Shuwen, at the end of his life, he was thinking, you know, I don't really need the system. I just need this to make my art better. I'm looking for these attributes. Right. Um, from what I see of other people who focus on Pi Gua Zhang, um, they can have uh, three, five, ten forms, right? A whole curriculum um, centered around a certain theme, right? Our Pi Gua sets are basically linkage sets, just like our Baji. So before we do, uh, like the first form links our last four lines, the second form links our first four lines, right? Um, and that's it. You know, and then we go into applications. We have some weapon sets that we nowadays in the organization we associate with Pigua, but historically, based on my research, they had nothing to do with Pigua. Right? Weapons don't really have a; uh, they're not associated with any particular system often. Right? Some rare examples, for example, like Qing Ping Jian, right? The the green duckweed sword is reportedly to have ten sets. Right. Um, but usually weapons were, you know, it belonged to any system. People freely borrowed from it, right? right. It's hard to really show like, oh, this is a, uh, a, a Tongbei sword form, or this is a Shaolin sword form. If you look at sets on YouTube, it's hard to really tell, right? But hand sets, right? There are distinct flavors, right? right? So um, all in all, sorry, that was a lot of different no, no, so, the, the Summing up, right? We... My teacher would teach Baji Piwa, Baji Piwa, and, and that's kind of how we, we that's how it's done in Taiwan. Um, my teacher is not very strict about things. So these days, if you come in and we're in the middle of Piwa, you're going to learn Piwa with us, right? Um, never mind, you, you, didn't, you didn't start off with Baji. Oh, well, huh, we're doing Piwa today, right? Yeah. So um, nowadays, I think teaching, as my teacher has gotten older, it's a little bit more relaxed. So you learn whatever you can. Uh, whereas before, maybe there was more structure, more strict about it. And the other thing is, is that our Pigua system or Pigua forms are just lines linked together, right? Um, 
with various, like there's maybe a little bit of similarity with the first form and the mother form of Pigua, uh, Mo, Mo Mian Chuan, uh, which was originally the first set, but the second set, not really. Um, and the other thing to note is that I, I think that it is just the pieces of Pigua that we feel help us, but not, I would not, I will not profess that we have a system, right? Um, just so I don't step on any toes. That's my opinion. Okay. You mentioned also uh, Tongbei and you were talking about your trip to Taiwan. And I, I saw one of your videos um, where you were practicing Tongbei with Johnson Lin in Taiwan. Uh, was that the first time that you'd met him? That was the first time I met him. Yeah. Um, and a little backstory. Um, so mm -hmm. my wife's pregnant oh, and uh, baby's due in April. Yeah. And I, I've had a great run. I have, I have traveled to places all across the United States learning Kung Fu. I've gone overseas, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, China, Vietnam. And once I knew that, you know, we were starting a family, I got this itch. I was like, I got to see Taiwan. Yeah. It's been, you know, my Kung Fu comes from Taiwan. My teacher's from Taiwan. I want to be able to see how my training compares to what's done in Taiwan. Yeah. Right. My teacher moved here again in the, in the seventies. And so, um, you know, he learned a lot from Grandmaster Lu in private lessons, but he also, uh, you know, learned from his Kung Fu brothers. That's not atypical. So I wanted to go see it for myself. And I'm like, I don't have a lot of time. So let's just do it now. Right. Yeah. So um, and before then, like I had had this habit of posting videos on my Facebook and YouTube and that enjoyed a little bit of popularity. So when I went to Taiwan, they sort of knew who I was because some people had asked. Uh, and they knew that my material was more or less the same. So when I went there, despite the fact that I don't speak Chinese fluently, by the way, I've learned it basically by listening to my teacher and ordering at Chinese restaurants, messing up, trying again. Uh, my wife is Chinese, so we'll practice. Um, so I can, I usually joke, I can pretend to be Chinese for about 15, 20 minutes. And then someone's going to call my bluff, right? Yeah. Because once we go on beyond Kung Fu and, and food, and they yeah. ask me about politics or something else. I, I, I just say, oh, what team with I don't understand. And they're like, oh, wait a minute, you're not Chinese? <laughs> Anyways, so I go to Taiwan um, and I, I, I set up this trip where I'm like, I got to meet, I want to meet the chairman, current chairman of the organization. Among, uh, I want to see Adam Shu, I want to see these people, whatever. So I organized this trip. And, you know, Johnson Lin, uh, our chairman, was one of the first people that I wanted to see. And so I come by. Wutan headquarters in Taipei. And, um, you know, Master Lin, despite the fact that he's the chairman, um, you know, he had learned from Grand Master Liu in a later generation. So he didn't know my Kung Fu teacher personally, right? And, um, you know, so I, I didn't know how he would receive me, but he was very kind. Um, and, you know, despite the language barrier, I think he understands more English than than he says he does. And he figured out that I understood more Chinese than he thought I would. Um, he decided to share with me his the the a little bit of Tongbei. Um, I had done Tongbei before, right? So it wasn't like it was entirely foreign concept. Um, I didn't learn Tongbei from Wu Tan, right? I learned Tongbei with another with a couple of other teachers, right? Uh, but the Tongbei that I, I observed uh, was five element Tongbei. So Wu Xing Tongbei. Um, so those five, he went over the five basic hands during that session, right? Um, and those five basics include Chuan, piercing, right? Pai, slapping. Shui, um, Shui is the same character as wrestling, but think of it as throwing kind of. Zhong uh, which is a punch. And try and try and pay try. Um, man, why am I forgetting this right now? Because it's because it's an interview. <laughs> try and pay try. There's one other one. There's one other one, and it's in the video. Um, so he gave me some pointers on those particular hand techniques, right? Um. I don't, I don't really know where he learned his Tongbei from. I think he wrote it in his biography, but it was, it's not something that's often practiced in Wutan. So it's not the, I don't think it's the whole system, 
right? And even then, Tongbei was never really focused on forms, right? Um, it's usually just single techniques and then combinations. And forms came about after, right? Um, when I was, I, I'll, sometimes I'll go on these spurts and try to look for people to learn stuff. And one of the teachers that I had learned from, uh, who's from, who's teaching in Massachusetts, uh, Master Huan, he told me that in his teacher who came from Dongbei, um, you know, he said that the, the, some people never didn't really care about the forms and learn the forms. And the, his teacher actually made up forms to compete with the praying mantis school. And so he made short sets and long sets. Um, and all of those things were probably made up in the 20s and 30s, you know, so not essential. And I think the Tongbei system in, in Taiwan is probably mostly five element Tongbei. And uh, they focus mainly on and single technique and combinations, right? So unfortunately, you know, I, I was only able to learn those five basic movements, but I, I won't he didn't really teach me anymore because we went, that class was mainly a Pigua class. Mm -hmm. So they kind of gelled together. That's why he brought it in. Nice. Other than that, did you find that the curriculum there was fairly similar to what you'd learned? I think the core of it is the same, right? I was able to run through their basics and, um, you know, and, and the other teachers that I met uh, who maybe in part, they are, they are all descended from Grandmaster Lu's legacy, but some of them are part of some splinter organizations. Um, my training aligned with theirs probably like 90, 95%, right? Um, sure, if people looking on the outside would say, well, you know, Viet has a little bit of flair to his. I mean, you can see in the videos, right? Like you can, like, for example, when I met uh, Xu Jingying uh, in Taichung, um, I did Kuo Mu Jian which is our famous sword form. And he had one of his students do it. Um, you'll notice there's slight differences in power generation and stances, but the form structure is the same. The flavor is gonna be a little bit different, right? Um, but all in all, like, I was just so happy to see that, you know, it, it, it helped answer a question in my mind, right? And every, I didn't doubt my teacher for a second, right. but you just wanna know whether you're on the right path. Am I on, am I on the road to, towards something? Right. And I felt that when I was there, I, I didn't feel I was any worse than anybody. Right. And to be quite frank, I think I was a little bit better than some of the people I met because why? I think a lot of times we feel in America, so we hear from our teachers, oh, training is so much harder in China and Taiwan and Hong Kong. Right. Back then people did this and this and this. Um, that might not necessarily be true now. Right. There's a lot of unique Kung Fu styles in America. There are a lot of great committed Kung Fu practitioners in America, right? You don't have to go far, right? If you know where to look and you know who to talk to, um, you can find somebody. And that's kind of how I've, been, I've gone on my journey, right? I've never prioritized uh, or thought that people in Asia necessarily train harder or better than people in America. Um, and what I found there is people struggle with the same things as we do. It's very hard to be a professional martial artist. So everyone has a day job, right? And even young people are not really all that interested in learning Kung Fu, right? They're more interested in things like basketball and, and other things. And so, you know, we, we basically evened up the playing field because they're losing interest. And for the people who are still practicing Kung Fu now, right? We tend to be obsessed with it, yeah. right? We tend to be nerds about it. Yeah, right? absolutely. And we're probably going to maintain our practice regardless of what other people say, right? Yeah. I don't care how great MMA gets, right? right. I'm still probably going to practice Kung Fu. Why? Yeah. Because that's my interest, right? right? I've tried to find a reason for to, to practice like all these years and, you know, do it. Do I do it because of combat effectiveness or to protect my family and this and that? I think what I was able to arrive at, and this is just very simple, it makes me happy. Yeah. Right. And if it makes you happy and it, 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 it's not, it's not a, it's not an unsafe endeavor, you should do it. Right. And that, that's kind of why I do it. It makes me happy. And I'm not going to explain myself any further. Right? Yeah. yeah. That's no it. need. Yeah. No, it, it, it does become an obsession for a lot of us uh, in a good way. Yeah. I, I want to take just a slight detour here because I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about Vietnamese martial arts, because this is something that fascinates me and there's not a lot of great information on it out there. 
Um, could you talk a little bit about that? W did your father practice Vietnamese martial arts at all, or was it? Um... No, he he only told me about it, but he didn't have any knowledge about it. And I I got into it because uh, you know when I was in college, I was the um, trainer for we had a little bit of a martial arts club and it wasn't really, it was really, uh, my goal was to get these, get people who were interested ready for a performance for a culture night right? at some time of the year. So right. I was responsible for both the Chinese and the Vietnamese clubs. And I was embarrassed to say that I didn't really know what Vietnamese martial arts was. I, I presumed that we did have martial arts, hmm. but I didn't know anything about it. And, uh, you know, I did a little bit of research. I, I heard about Vovi Nam, which is, considered to be the national martial art, but there were certain characteristics about it that made me doubt whether it was truly traditional, right? Um, Vobi Nam um, was started by an individual by the name of Nguyen Lop, and it was started uh, as an art to combat the French. Yeah. And when he was teaching in the North, he didn't, he taught basic techniques and, uh, you know, calisthenics and ac like acrobatic techniques but it was a pretty simple art. It wasn't, there were, there wasn't any forms. There wasn't uh, much to it. And then when he, when the country was partitioned in 1954 and he came down South, um, his, he, students from other systems started to come in and bring, bring more material and enrich the material to the present day where they have lots of, lots of sets, lots of, lots of weapons, all fancy uh, scissor kicks and stuff like that. And a lot of people, especially internationally are under this impression that, oh, that must be Vietnamese martial arts because it's the most popular thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's like same thing, like saying Taekwondo is right. traditional Korean martial arts. That couldn't be further from the truth, right? I don't think Taekwondo has any link to things like Taekyun. Um, their traditional martial arts looks very different. And the same thing with us. Uh, Vovi now is a, is a hybrid martial art. And Vietnamese people uh, to the present day have this habit of taking what's useful and just saying, hey, this this hodgepodge is ours, right? That, that's how we survive to the present day, as a country that's only one third the size of California. When you're next to a sleeping giant like China, um, you don't really care about uh, doing the most traditional thing. We do what works, right? Right, absolutely. Um, it's guerrilla warfare, right? Right. That's that's how Vietnam has sustained itself. Yeah. So um, during college, I went back to Vietnam for the first time, and I went to Saigon and learned. Uh, a single form from uh, a school by the name of Big Big Salam Kuk. Um, Vietnamese is interesting because it makes use, we have native Vietnamese words and we have Vietnamese words of Chinese origin, right? Um, so the name of the school, if you translate it, would be a, a, the dragon who's lying on a sandy beach. Uh, but Big Big, that, that, that style name um, usually is, uh, used to note native Vietnamese martial arts um, and more specifically stemming from a certain area of the middle part of Vietnam uh, during the Qing dynasty. So Tianlong had 10 great campaigns and one of those campaigns was to annex Vietnam. And there was an individual who uh, came up from that area of middle part in the middle part of Vietnam um, he was able to gather troops to his side and repel the invasion, right? And the way that we did that, I mean, the, the real facts about that is we fought during Chinese New Year. We didn't fight on the, the designated date. We fought it. We had Chinese New Year earlier, Lunar New Year earlier, and we said, screw you, we're going to fight you today. And the Chinese were taken off gawkers. They thought maybe there was an armistice or something, right? So we cheated. Right. But that doesn't matter, right, when you're trying to survive. Right, right? there's no cheating. <laughs> so... All up and down uh, Vietnam now, right? Um, you'll see schools broadly divided into Thiu Lam, which is the Vietnamese pronunciation of Xiaoling, right? Or Siu Lam in Cantonese, right? Vietnamese and Cantonese shares a lot of similarities in pronunciation. So if you know Cantonese, you'll be able to pick up Vietnamese easy. Siu Lam, Thiu Lam, and then Bing Bing, right? So these two schools, and it's not to say that these are broadly divided. They've, they've had some mixing back and forth, back and forth. So I learned uh, this Bing Ding style in, in Saigon. I learned a single form. And then when I went back to Orange County, which is home to the biggest Vietnamese diaspora outside of Vietnam, I was able to find teachers from that system. And I was able to learn it gradually from basics, going on to the forms, weapons, some application. 
and um, across like across time, like I was able to pick up other styles of Vietnamese martial arts and come to a broader understanding of what characterizes it, um, what it is and what it isn't, right? And, uh, you know, not to knock Vovi now, it's definitely, we don't do scissor kicks. We don't jump in the air and scissor kick people. That's not, that's not traditional. All the teachers that I met, they would never do such a thing, right? I think, uh, you know, I would say that certain characters of Vietnamese, traditional Vietnamese martial arts is, um, you know, strong stances, right? Uh, probably, you know, because of that Southern influence, uh, more of an emphasis on hand technique and lots of jumping and squatting, right? Um, and I tend to think because if you're fighting against a purportedly taller, stronger opponent, like a Chinese or a Mongol, you're not going to fight him head on, right? right. So you're going to be jumping around and Changing stuff like levels. that. So yeah. the forms tend to have that sort of uh, flair to it, right? Interesting. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's basically that. Most recently I was in Vietnam a couple of weeks ago um, and I wanted to research Vietnamese kickboxing, right? Because I, I, I tend to think that Vietnam being so close to Laos and Cambodia, being part of French Indochina, um, I knew that there was um, events organized to, uh, you know, to compete with each other. So likely Vietnamese had some interactions with Muay Thai but why hasn't it survived to the present day? Well, that's not true. It has uh, in bits and pieces, but because the government has put on these certain regulations of not using elbows and knees, um, that's discouraged. And more form practice and demonstrations, that's promoted, right? But there are still individuals who still keep up with that. And I was able to kind of glean a little bit of that. Um, one of the systems that I was able to pick up over the years was the system called Hong Zala Fusud. Uh, which is a, a system of nagel um, that's focused on tendon uh, strengthening, right? Or some people call it tendon pulling. Um, and it kind of resembles uh, Hungar's iron wire. Mm -hmm. um, but the way that it's practiced is that we have singular movements that come together in smaller sets, and then you can combine them together, right? Um, so when I practice Hungar, and I, I learned the iron wire form. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're doing a, a 10 minute nei gong set or 15 yeah. minute, 20 minute, you just want to get through it. Yeah. It's very Quite hard that. to focus on the little details. And for those that have the, the mental fortitude and the awareness to do so, um, I applaud you. But I know that, you know, when I'm doing a form that long, I'm just trying to get through it, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm more of a short sets kind of guy. So um, having the system enabled where you can say, look, I'm going to do, we usually do singular movements 36 times. And you go through, you can do five movements in a session or 12 movements in the session. You got to really focus on that little detail. You want to go through a form, we'll just connect them together. Right. So that sort of, sort of modular setup, right. Nice. Appeals to my personal practice rather than long drawn out sets. Right. Does it have the same kind of, um, focus on changing like the intra-abdominal pressure, like the breath work that iron wire has in it? Is there a lot of that type of stuff in it? Um, there aren't any sounds associated with it. Um, and so it doesn't appear as eccentric. <laughs> There's a funny story of Grandmaster Su Zhang. He was <clears throat> in, I think the Guoshus in Baltimore and lots of Kung Fu people come to that event. That's a big event. And there was somebody doing iron wire and he laughed so hard he fell out of his chair because they're laughing and crying and displaying all their emotions, right? Um, the, this Hungar, Hungar Nei Gong system um, really just focuses on, you can either do a natural breathing or you can do reverse breathing, um, but nothing too technical. The more important thing is you have an awareness for your tendons. So the connections between muscles uh, and bones. So for example, if I do the first, first movement, right. And I go like this, right. I'm going to flare out my pec miter and this, right. So when I punch rather than just stop here, I can actually extend a little bit further, right. So using the back and then hollowing out the chest, right. Really characteristics of Hakka styles, right. Yeah. If you notice when you do jigbo, uh, which is the, the first form in Bach May. You know, when they do their beauty and then they, they do their Phoenix eye, they don't just stop here. They don't stay square. They extend a little right. bit further. And that system is just mainly focused on that, if I could simplify it, right? Yeah. Focusing on 
your back, rounding the back, hollowing the chest, extending your lips, but not outside of your frame, right? Still keeping within the six harmonies, right? right? So that's basically, you know, that system in a nutshell. Interesting. Have you ever thought about um, compiling this research that you've done on Vietnamese martial arts in any kind of a format, like a video or a book format? You know, I, I came back from my last trip and I had people asking me that, that mm -hmm. I should write a book um, because there's very little material written in English about this. Yeah. And now that I've been able to experience so many different styles, wouldn't it be nice to give some, some exposition? I have for years wanted to write something on the level of Robert W. Smith. I, yeah. that book, Masters of Methods, like it's still... Is, plays a prominent uh, position on my bookshelf, right? Um, I just loved how, you know, you read that book and it's so tantalizing. The names yeah. that he puts down and his experiences is so beautifully written, right? Yeah. Um, and I would love to be able to write a version of that, whether it would be about, you know, Chinese martial arts through Taiwan that I've done or Vietnamese martial arts. I just need the time. Right. Yeah. You know, right now I'm a full fledged physician. I've been out of training for about four years. I specialize in Alzheimer's disease. I see patients, uh, you know, on a full time basis. Um, I'm about to have a baby on the way. Yeah. Um, I have a You're lot of things that I have to time. budget. But one of, I'm, I'm hoping that and, and my videos like I, I it's easier to make a video. Sure. Right. I think if you're re learning about history and theory, books are the best. Right. But yeah. if you're wanting to learn stuff, yeah. um, movement, it's a video. And so I have put some of those videos on my YouTube page, on my Facebook page. Um, I'm always open to answering questions from anybody who who wants to ask. Um, and maybe, I, you know, if and when I have the time, because I've, I've written little little snippets, I should compile them together um because i'd love to be able to just push push that a little bit more i wish that people knew more about vietnamese martial arts and unfortunately people don't yeah there's so. very little quality uh, material in the english language about it unfortunately so it'd be great if you could get around to that eventually something yeah like yeah so let's talk a little bit about your school um uh, what, what, what's your teaching format like? Do people do you teach just the way that you were taught, where you just teach what you teach and people come in and learn what you're teaching, or do you start people out according to their abilities, or how exactly does that work? Um. So I kind of going back a little bit. So I, my wife and I, we recently moved to Seattle, so we've been here for a little over a year, um, and. You know, my teacher has given me permission to teach for some time. So when I was a medical student, I did teach a Tai Chi group in the Detroit area um, for six years, two years as a medical student, and then four years as a resident. And I taught a group there at a local community church in Madison Heights in Michigan. Um, then I went to Cincinnati for my fellowship in dementia and I worked uh, you know, two years in Chicago during the pandemic. That wasn't a good time to get students. Wow. And then after getting married, we moved here to Seattle. So, um, you know, I wanted to start a group um, to just have people to practice. Like I, I'm not, not trying to start a huge business or anything. It's not about that. I have my day job. Like this is a passion and right. uh, I have my job and my passions, right? The job helps me make money so I can keep going, promoting my passions, right? right. We're those people who dedicate themselves to the passions. That's amazing. I just can't do that. Right. Um, so one of my Kung, Kung Fu cousins, um, Mike Wong, he's a student of a Wu-Tang branch in New York. And so he, he is also here in Seattle. And we teamed up together to have this little practice group, right? Um, and we practice in a park in, in Kirkland, uh, which is on the east side of Seattle. Um, and we really teach according to what students want to learn. So um, I have, I, I do a general Kung Fu warm up and, and, you know, we have certain basics, but then I eventually will say, what do you want to learn today? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you want to learn from me? Would you have any pressing questions? And my goal is if you have five minutes or five years with me, I'm going to make it worth your while. Right. Cause I don't, my approach is, I want to teach what you want to learn, 
right? Not not what I want to teach you, right? You're not right. just I'm not just kind of roping you in for the ride, right? right. Um, and I understand that the nature of people coming together just as easy as people come together, people go in their different directions, right? It's very hard to keep anybody anybody's attention for longer than a couple of minutes, right? We're the TikTok, Instagram generation now. And so every student I, I've, I've taught a little bit different and I've taught according to what they wanted and what they're able to, right? So I had a student um, who, you know, he was in the military um, and he had fought in Afghanistan. Um, he had done work overseas. Uh, he speaks multiple languages. And I had met him in a Xingyi class in the area. And uh, he did this application that didn't look Xingyi to me. I'm like, where did you learn that? I was like, oh, I've been reading this comic book. Uh, and it has Baji in it. I was like, oh, wait, I do Baji. So if you ever want to do anything, uh, if you want to learn more about it, then let's come out to the park. And that, that single meeting led to me teaching him Baji, the system, right, um, for the time period that he was here. Right. And we took it very systematically. And I basically taught him almost as a private student. Right. right. Dr. Baji and Pigua. And I, I focused on the core of our system. So there are certain things that I feel are in common to everybody. And then there are stuff that my teacher um, or I've gotten from my Kung Fu uncle. Those things are separate. Yeah. So I was like, I'm going to give you what everybody has. And then, you know, that's my that's my promise to you. And if we have this many sessions, we're going to go over this, if that's OK with you. Right. So we were able to accomplish those goals. I had another individual, he was in his late seventies and he was interested in Xing Yi Chuan. Right. And he had read Robert W. Smith's books and wanted, he was mainly a Japanese martial art practitioner. Um, and so we focused on the five elements and the linking form. Right. Um, we got to two of the animals before he had some heart issues and we decided to take a little bit of a break. Right. Another student, uh, she uh, had been learning Chen style Tai Chi and what didn't feel very confident about applications and sparring. So I didn't teach her any forms because she didn't want to learn it. So we've just been going through pad drills. So I teach according to what people want. I, I don't, and luckily because I have this, this background, I'm able to cater to that student. Yeah. Um, but I would say it's almost like a semi-private basis and uh, very informal. Yeah. very informal yeah so. so you know you mentioned what we all already know is that you know people don't have a lot of attention span or time these days and given that um what what do you think the future of these arts is what do you think their place is 21st century and life gets faster and faster uh i have to take pause because it is sort of depressing to think about the state of Chinese martial arts or, or traditional martial arts in general yeah. uh, in the present day, right? Um, we had our heyday in probably the 70s and 80s. Oh, yes. I came at the, like, near the end of that heyday. So when I look at these old magazines, back then when people didn't have internet and you got your information from that monthly issue, right. Kung Fu magazine, right. martial arts magazine, oh, Bawa Journal, that was amazing. Right. Yeah. Um, for my, for me, like being a, someone growing up in the nineties, it was forum post, Right. And nowadays, you know, with, uh, the rise of combat sports and, um, you know, those, those fights that we've all seen between Tai Chi and MMA or Wing Chun versus MMA, there's very little interest in, uh, learning Chinese martial arts. If you have any sort of uh, physical ability, you're probably going to go towards the combat sport realm, right? Yeah. Um, I think that kung fu will kung fu and tai chi and, and traditional Chinese martial arts uh, will likely be more niche, right? We will we'll probably lose our schools, our public schools, and people will go back to training garages and parks again, yeah. and it will be based on word of mouth. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I think we, we shot ourselves in the foot a little bit because of a lot of the, you know, some people didn't want to teach their entire art. People got tired of being hazed. Yeah. Um, people got tired of misinformation. Yeah. And so they've, they've gone to other things that have satisfied their curiosities. 
right? Um, I think, you know, Tai Chi in the health realm, right? And Qigong in the health realm will probably continue to grow, but we need to make sure that we're not promising BS, right? That right. we uh, we be honest and upfront about our practice with others. Um, we're on the brink of dying. I'm not going to mince words about that. Yeah. And the way that we can just survive, I, w- I won't even say thrive, but just survive, right? Is we need to come together, right? This whole, you know, I'm right, you're wrong, uh, cheat tricks, that kind of thing. We got to let that go, yeah. right? And so we, instead of, you know, other styles, they, they, they have much more unity than, than ours. You get two Kung Fu practitioners in a room with each other, there's going to be a lot of finger pointing and mudslinging. Yeah. It's my teacher versus your teacher. Yeah. So that's unfortunate. I agree. Um, mm. So I think unity is going to help. The other thing is being able to be honest and upfront about what is real and what isn't. Right. So, you know, the, the days of standing in horse dance for 30 minutes and without understanding or a monkey see monkey do attitude, they're gone. Right. right. If you can't come up with an explanation that's succinct, right? Brevity is what, then you probably don't know what you're doing, right? So uh, that's sort of the measure, uh, and that's why I've taken this this paradigm of if you have five minutes or five years with me, I hope to make it your, worth your while. And even if you know we don't stick around with each other, at least you can look back and say, look, you know that that was a check mark, a bookmark in my martial arts journey. You know, I can still bring that to something else that I'm doing, right? So, you know, I, I, I don't think we're, we're going to fare very well. Um, I think that, you know, for those people who have dedicated their lives to it, they're going to continue to do it. My teacher has no intention of stopping, right? Yeah. And um, as I am on the brink of becoming a father, I, I question myself whether I'll be able to continue. But I think most, most people would say, yeah, like, likely is going to keep pushing forward. And I hope so too. Right? Yeah. Um, so... I, I don't think we're doing very well. And I think that we, we can help to kind of bend it back, right? Nice. But it's going to take time and effort. Um, and I, I would say that we, we are likely going to go back to being hush hush. You know, yeah. do you know, you, you know, somebody who does Kung Fu still? Oh, okay. That guy. Okay. Well, let's go, let's go talk to him a little bit. Right. I think that's where we're heading. I think I would agree. And uh, I think that you're going to keep practicing, um, regardless of how much you have on your plate. I don't think you have a choice based on your, your history. It's just, it's in, it's in your DNA now. So. I would love to, you know, I don't know how you feel as a teacher, but I, I would love to have somebody come to me and say, you know what, this, this mess that you've acquired over years and years. And, you know, I would love to learn all of it. Yeah. Uh, I, I've, I've taught snippets of, of what I've, what I've been able to, to practice over the years. And people have, have finished things to varying degrees. Right? I taught Baji to an acupuncturist and he stopped after Shao Baji because he said that his heart was giving him trouble. I taught two kids some Wing Chun and my heart was broken when they told me after two, three years, it's not like we're going to remember all this. You know, and I just stopped. I, I lost, I lost the will to yeah. teach anymore. Yeah. Right? Um, so I, I, I just take it as, you know, I'm sharing for me, right? Yeah. Somebody, you can liken the role of a teacher as somebody who is just taking a student from one dock to another across the river, right? If I can get there and get you across there, then you go on your journey, right? I had a great time along the way, right? So I don't carry that burden of trying to pass it down, everything that I've learned, but I will try to teach you, right? To make you feel like you got something, right? And then we stay together, we stay together. If not, that's okay too. Right. I think that's a great philosophy. Well, could you tell everybody where they can find you at? I feel like we've barely scratched the surface of your history here, but um, you we're just about out of time. So I want to make sure everybody can find you and find your channel because there is a ton of good information on this. Sure. Um, I have a, you know, I made a, a website on Wix. Um, so, and I, I need a page to, promote it more 
but I think the best way, if anybody's interested, um, I'll give you my contact information, my email, and you can maybe put it at the yeah, We'll put links in the description. Um, so uh, that's pretty much probably the best way. I, I make myself available on Sundays in the morning um, at Edith Milton Park at Kirkland, um, which is pretty close to my apartment. Um, and I'd love to be able to communicate and just exchange information with anybody that's interested. Um, I'm not a full-time teacher. Um, because I'm a full-time physician, but not a full-time teacher. And I don't even think of myself as a teacher. I'm more of a coach. So, um, I'm just hoping to interact with like-minded individuals. Um, so we do, we typically will start around eight thirty, nine o'clock and go until noontime. Uh, sometimes we'll have a lunch together if the student is free, but no pressure. Um, and yeah, we just do it once a week. Um, and I'll, I'll leave my contact information with you yeah absolutely we'll put that in a link uh in the description all right well Viet, it was great talking to you uh Viet Le, everybody wu tan seattle <music>